have a roll call, please, Mr. Calavito? Mr. DiDonato? Present. Ms. Long? Here. Mr. Markulek? Here. Ms. Murray? Here. Ms. Peterson? Here. Uh, Mr. Sawicki? Here. Ms. Tracy? Here. Ms. Wolf? Here. We have a quorum. Can we please rise for the flag salute? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The New Jersey Open Public Meetings Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of the public bodies at which any business affecting their interests is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of the Act, the Hopewell Valley Regional Board of Education has caused notice to this meeting to be published by having the date, time, and place thereof communicated to the Hopewell Valley News, the Times, and the Trentonian on January 9, 2018 and March 13, 2018. This meeting notice was also sent to Comcast Cable and Verizon Fios. The board reserves the right to enter into executive session during all meetings of the Board of Education. The meeting is being videotaped for the purpose of board review, future reference, preparation of the minutes, and viewing on Comcast Channel 19, Verizon Fios, Channel 32, and the school district website www.hvrsd.org. I'd like to make a resolution to approve the minutes of the 2518 work session meeting and the minutes of the 22618 special meeting, the 21218 special meeting, the 21218 regular meeting. <coughs> Second. Thank you. May I have a vote vote, please? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstained? Motion carries. Caroline? Yes. Okay, so for past events of the high school, there was an all night volleyball tournament which took place Friday, February 23rd, and that ran from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. It was a great turnout, and all the participants enjoyed this event returning to Hopewell. Uh, the proceeds, proceeds went to benefit the class of 2018. The boys track mile team placed second in nationals. The Drowsy Chaperone musical took place March 3rd, 9th, and 10th. And then on Wednesday, March 14th, there was a school walkout and the announcements as well as the walkout was led by students. And it included 17 minutes dedicated to memorializing the lives lost in Parkland, Florida. The Yes Club presented a documentary called Chasing Coral. And this was an award-winning film which highlighted the effects of global climate change is having on the diverse coral ecosystems in the ocean. And this took place Friday, March 16th. There was a Hopewell Valley Spelling Bee, Saturday, March 17th, and this was open to district elementary students from third through fifth grade. Girls Lacrosse team took a trip to Frederick, Maryland this past weekend. Uh, their tournament was canceled due to the snowstorms, but they were able to uh, watch a University of Maryland women's lacrosse game. And then spring sports are now underway after tryouts that took place earlier this month. There are a few upcoming events, the spring pep rally, which will take place this Thursday, March 29th. Instead of volleyball or basketball between the classes, there will be a dodgeball competi competition between all the classes. Senior superlatives will also be recognized and sports teams will, as always, be announced. And then there is a upcoming blood drive. It was canceled last Wednesday due to snow, but when a date is determined, it'll be open to school and community. And then this week we are recognizing a spirit week leading up to the pep rally. So that is it. Did you have a question, Mr. Calvi? <laughs> yeah, we were trying to figure out what senior superlatives are. Funniest, yeah, funniest. right? Oh, uh, was the funny. Happiest couple or things like that. Most likely to sleep in class. Yeah. Most likely. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get that one, Mr. Mark Leck, when That's you were in school? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. Does anybody have any questions? Any other questions for Caroline? <laughs> okay. Um, so it is now my report. I want to, first of all, welcome and thank all of you for coming this evening. It's uh, nice to have a packed house um, and to have really wonderful things to celebrate, all our Teachers of the Year. 
Um, it's just, it's great. It's really fun and great to look forward to every year. Um, we do have some tougher things to talk about, and I will include that in my report. So I apologize for being a little bit of a downer, but then we'll be on the upside when we get to your, to your congratulations. So many of us have moved to our Hopewell Valley for a life that is balanced between many quality of life factors, including open space, our highly achieving schools, walkability within the boroughs, and ease of travel to the mountains, the beach, and cities of Philadelphia, New York, and DC. Above all, our slower pace, lower cost of living, and sense of safety here compared to the cities is why some live here and travel to the cities for work. This past month has been particularly concerning for families, staff, and school students regarding the safety of our school environment. Our board members have been fielding opinions on the future of our school security plan. The incident at CHS on Friday, March 9th, brought compliments to the district regarding transparency and swiftness of communication to the public, but also further concern for the ease of access for people without permission to enter our schools. Dr. Smith, later in the evening, will share additional levels of security that are included in our referendum and the budget to be presented and voted on by the board this evening. In addition to Parkland, Florida last month, the school shooting at Great Mills High School in Maryland this past Tuesday provided further support for community members and parents to urge the district to protect our schools with highly trained carrying security officers. In Maryland, the school SRO prevented the shooter from escalating casualties. In addition to our added security measures, they believe that a majority of residents would support the more effective levels of security they are suggesting to decrease the likelihood of mass casualties and ensure that our children return home unharmed every day. <coughs> Further, the gunman that entered Panera Bread on Nassau Street in Princeton on that same day, followed by a five-hour standoff, provided additional concerns about the seemingly safe environment we live in. Our district, staff, students, administration, and board members hear and share your concerns. We are taking necessary steps to ensure that we are providing the most safe and secure environment for our students with respect for the nurturing environment we strive for in our schools and community. The administration has already requested a security audit by the, ne the New Jersey State Department of Education, School Preparedness, and Emergency Planning Department. We've discussed holding daytime board meetings for the staff and children at CHS and possibly Timberlane to hear their voices and perspectives in addition to special meetings to hear public opinion on school security in the near future. Finally, I will transition to Dr. Smith who will share an exciting creative method he has co-created throughout the week with the board, administration, and HVEA to make up for the two of the five snow days that will, we would have otherwise shortened our district spring break. All right. On. Yeah, great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Hi, everybody, and I will speak more as we get closer to the Teacher of the Year and Service Professionals of the Year, but I echo the Board President's comments. It is very nice to see a, a number of folks here this evening. Um, so I, with that, I ask you and I invite you all to stay through the entire presentation because we have the budget presentation after all of this, and that's always a, a fun and interesting um, presentation. Um, but in all seriousness, we were faced as a district um, with an unprecedented amount of snow days. This year we had five snow days that uh, necess necessitated the closing of school. So in conversations over this last snow day, when we were going into our second day in spring break, um, I reached out to members of our teaching staff, our teachers association, um, and a, our board president and vice president uh, regarding the potential of transitioning those days in spring break to e-learning days or online days. Um, so I just want to kind of run through that just so folks are aware that I've heard a lot of feedback from folks about um, what those days would have been had we gone to school and I make no excuses for the fact that I would expect that those days were not well attended. If we were open on Thursday and Friday of spring break I fully expect that we would have limited number of students. Although the vast majority of staff would, would be on site, the number of students would probably um, not equate to our ability of having a full day of school, meaning specifically of having teachers teach information that students would miss out upon. So it would turn out to be days that were, as one person uh, shared with me, you know, days that were not full educational days. Um, so with that, we started looking at options and what, how could we effectively use those days 
provide flexibility and also advance some of our district initiatives, specifically our use of technology resources. And I want to underscore that these aren't, the expectation is not that students are sitting in front of computers all day on these two days, but more to experience a self-paced educational program. Um, we know that in a brief survey, all of the surrounding colleges um, have at least um, one course that majors that students are taking online. Um, in a unofficial um, in an unofficial survey of former graduates, uh, the number of students I spoke to all had taken an online course within the last two years. Um, so this is something that we've discussed on the district and we said this would be, a, a, I think, an excellent opportunity to try this. So we're, I'm proposing this evening to the Board of Education, and I think this will be discussed more under new business, but as we get there, um, that the, the district have two e-learning days in place of opening school on April, um, the Thursday and Friday of April, April 5th and 6th. Um, the online content that is expected to be developed by our teachers will be meaningful and relevant versus days that would you know, just be placeholders or babysitting services for some, that folks would walk away with some sort of education and on an online education. Um, so specifically, I sent out a, kind of an update to families because I fielded, as you can imagine, a number of uh, questions about logistically what does this mean. Um, so I just want to be specific so everybody here knows that what I'm proposing is schools will be closed on April 4th and 5th during spring break. Um, April 5th and 6th. Did I say 4th? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, um, the Hopewell Y, I know there's some confusion about this. Um, when we were going to school, the Hopewell Y canceled their scope days, but I've been in touch with them. Um, but they will offer scope for any uh, parent who needs childcare. Um, so schools are closed. The Y is open for those who require childcare. Um, Students will not need to log in on those specific days. That was a number of, of questions I received. People are on vacation or on transit on those days. That's not what this is about. This is about providing students materials and opportunities that aren't tied to a specific period of time. Um, the assignments, assuming, uh, or hopefully that if the board approves this, the assignments can be posted as early as tomorrow. Some teachers have already started working on them, but all will be posted prior to the start of spring break. Um, again, these assignments are self-paced, so they will be due when assigned by the teacher, um, not during spring break. Nothing will be assigned during spring break. Um, other things, just kind of going through this, um, you know, we do have a number of folks who either don't have internet access or will be places that don't have internet access, um, and they can speak to our, our teachers and we will work through that. Again, nothing is due when they, the day they return either. Um, is another opportunity for, for folks. We are opening our school media centers, and you can see the dates and times here when they will be open. Timberlane Middle, uh, Middle School will be open, Central High School Media Center will be open, and Stony Brook Media Center will be open for internet and printing access. For those folks that don't have computer access or they don't have internet access, um, for those who can even get to the, the buildings, we will work with them and give them localized internet access so they can get on that. So we've tried to address all of those concerns. Um, also, what if uh, um, students have um, questions while they're on break? Um, and teachers will make every effort to field students' questions in a timely manner. Um, if we have students have significant questions or there, there's bigger assignments, um, nothing will be due before those students can get their questions answered. So the teachers are also going to be very flexible um, through this. It's really about the experience, about making sure the students have exposure to something that's relevant um, and meaningful, but also that they're experiencing an online program prior to graduating our high school. Another one I received, um, we're not expecting kindergartners to log on for eight hours <laughs> in a day. That is not the goal of this. Elementary students will be, uh, will be given a packet um, that is age appropriate, um, and we're asking for, for just folks to oversee that. Um, Students with special needs, um, 504s or IEPs, accommodations will be made. Um, special education teachers work together this afternoon in preparation. Obviously, extended time and other accommodations will be honored through this. 
Um, so the, the other big question we get is, uh, so what classes will have work? As most people know, the high school is on a rotating schedule and the middle school is on an A day, B day schedule, that the high school will have flex days on that period. So all classes will be posted for that period. So the students should look as if it was just a regular uh, flex day. Um, teachers will prepare approximately 30 minutes of work for each class the student would have taken. Um, on, if, obviously, if a student has a study hall for in that period, there's nothing uh, for them to do um, unless they want to meditate or do mindfulness. We can work that into this also. Um, all kidding aside with that, though, on the elementary level, um, students should follow their special schedule day. So if they have art on the Thursday and music on the Friday, information will be posted um, that equates to those days. But all students will be provided a well um, uh, a mindfulness and wellness exercise for students that is away from the computer. Um, we're asking students to do something in wellness with a 90 second video that's all that would be online. They'll get information about that just telling what they did. So they don't even have to write anything. They just talk about what they did. Um, and the confusion is how I know which assignments. I got this from a student. The, every assignment will be marked clearly as e-learning assignment um, for that. So that's um, Obviously, the, I sent out a, a FAQ that was a little longer than this, but I'm happy to, to take any questions from the Board of Education um, regarding the e-learning idea. I'll ask the, the key <laughs> sure. one I was worried about, which was, could you please elaborate on what it means in terms of graduation for the seniors? So graduation, so I put this in my, uh, my email, graduation will stay. We have special dispensation from the State Board of Education that we will hold our ceremony prior uh, on the 20th. That will remain. Um, and seniors will receive their diplomas on the last day of school, which is June, June 22nd. So for those families that have, and if seniors have to leave before it made accommodations, we have heard folks uh, for that we will get the diploma to them. They can either come and pick it up or they can, we'll mail it out to them. But graduation is staying on the 20th. Last day of school is the 22nd. Graduation 20th, last day of school 22nd. I've only gotten that question about 300 times in the last, uh, so just making sure. Graduation the 20th, last day of school 22nd. Friday. <laughs> I think it's the 20th. The last day of school? 22nd, right. June 22nd. Any other questions? I don't have so much a question, but I have a comment. So they are, we, in EdCon this morning, they showed some slides of some of the potential things that the elementary school kids would be asked to do. And it actually looked like so much fun. I was thinking, you know, I think I might log on as an elementary student. It was really, really cute, like interactive kind of things that they could do, almost like they were like little scientists and they were supposed to observe things and do things. It just, it, I think they're gonna do a nice job with coming up with the program. So. I actually do have a question. So we're doing this this year for the first time. Will we do some sort of a survey afterwards or analysis to figure out whether people liked it, didn't like it? Yes, so thank you, excellent uh, question. So a couple things we're gonna just, we are able to track of uh, the number of students who actually complete. The teachers are, we're able to track the teachers logging on and, and through that. But we will also work through as we go forward for us, it's about the, the um, potential of this going forward. So assuming this is successful, we will look for ways to integrate this moving forward. Um, so a survey, we'll, we'll do a survey as we go through this, just about the, the interaction of it. Because it's a significant change, I don't deny that, and I know that the timing uh, could have been better you know, had we planned it out, but um, you know, we, the five days, kind of uh, having four snow days in March was uh, a lot. Yeah, so, so another quick question. So uh, assuming successful and assuming that we, you know, we, you know, it works well, um, do we ever envision this replacing, you know, snow days, right? You know, having, you know, prepackaged kind of material so that, you know, over the winter that, you know, you can use this in lieu of a snow day. So there are, there is one district that we know of that, that has tried that and I believe has received approval from the state to do that. Um, what that requires, according for the state, and I know there's still some work on this, is that the doors must be open and schools optional for, for students. However, they could stay at home and complete it. So do we envision this? I think the potential is there for once we go through this um, to see, to work out any kinks that are there, that 
I think we have the infrastructure, we have the knowledge, we have the talent to do it. So the long-winded response to a short question is yes. <laughs> well, you could ask them to send me an email because mine haven't been so. Yes. So we'll table the actual adoption to the, adopt, yep, the yep, new yep, business. Okay. Yep. okay. So now to the special event of the evening. You can turn right to me. Oh, all right. Yeah. So uh, tonight, those of you in TV land and also in the audience. We recognize our teachers of the year and service professionals of the year. I would like to acknowledge that this is the first year that we have um, acknowledged and are celebrating our service professionals of the year. So tonight you will meet each of our teachers of the year, one from each school. They went through a rigorous screening process. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Suzo, who will then turn it over to each principal. Mr. Suzo is going to discuss a little bit about the process, when it started, and then we're going to recognize each one. So now just simple logistics. Um, when you come, you're going to be recognized. Um, Mr. Souza will, will give you a token of appreciation from the school district, and uh, the board would like to acknowledge you by shaking your hands, and if you could come around the inside horseshoe. Um, and then we're good. We've already taken our picture, um, so I think we are good. So Mr. Souza, without, and if I could just say, um, aside, I think this was one of our, our proudest moments. Um, as a school district and a school board is when we have this meeting this evening. So we're very proud of your accomplishments and I thank you for your commitment to our students. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, this is truly one of the highlights of the year for the district and the Board of Education. Just a little bit of background. Each year, the Governor's Educator of the Year program honors teachers and educational service professionals throughout the state of New Jersey whose contributions to their students are exceptional. Staff members this evening were nominated by their peers, parents, and students. A committee from each building, consisting of administrators, staff members, and a parent representative, used the following criteria to select the recipient. Exceptional instructional techniques, superior ability to inspire students of all backgrounds and abilities to learn, respect and admiration of students, parents, and colleagues, Ability to foster excellence in education as evidenced by ongoing contributions to the improvement of student achievement and the learning environment. Each of our honorees this evening will be recognized by the Hope of Valley Education Foundation on April 13th at their Above and Beyond Gala. And they will also attend a luncheon at the county level in May with Dr. Smith and President Murray. At this time, I will invite up our building principals to come up and introduce their Educator of the Year, I would ask our honorees to come forward after they are introduced and be congratulated by our board members. You will also be receiving a certificate this evening and flowers. We're gonna start off first with Hope Elementary, David Frederick. Thank you. I'd like to start off by um, recognizing and congratulating all the support staff professionals that are being recognized this year, Mr. Young, Ms. Jordan, Mrs. Harbach, along with all of the recipients of the Governor's Teacher Award, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Amantia, Ms. Beck, Mrs. Bezetzner, Mrs. Weidman, who I will be forever indebted to. For those of you who don't know, she was my cooperating teacher when I was a student teacher at Bear Tavern many years ago. And the reason why I'm here today, Mrs. Hamer. Mrs. Allison Hamer received a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from Penn State University and her Master's in Elementary Education at Westchester University. Mrs. Hamer joined the Hopewell Elementary School family in September of 2012. Since then, she's taught advanced level math, advanced level reading, and she's currently a fifth grade literacy teacher. The following words were submitted by students, parents, and colleagues to describe what Mrs. Hamer means to them. And I quote, Allison is an example of the strong and caring person that we would like our girls to grow to be. Allison is a champion for students and a masterful language arts teacher. She has a special way of teaching the whole child. We have Allison's courage with us. We have been transformed by it. Allison is a leader of the pack. 
an exceptional educator and guide. What a gift she has given us. This year, Hopewell Elementary School received nearly 30 nominating letters, an all-time high, and Allison emerged from the pack. Please join me in congratulating a teacher who takes full advantage of each and every interaction with kids, parents, and faculty members. Our recipient of the Governor's Teacher Award, Mrs. Allison Hamer. From Stony Brook Elementary, Steve Wilfing. Thank you, Mr. Suzo. Good evening, Dr. Smith, members of the Board of Education, Hopewell Valley community members. I'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you to all of our dedicated staff members across the district for their tireless effort throughout the year. And to the Governor's Teacher and Educational Services Recognition awardees tonight, my most sincere congratulations. The award winner from Stony Brook is a graduate of Oswego State University of New York uh, with a BA in Fine Arts and Graphic Design. She moved on to the University of Rochester where she earned a master's in education with certifications in general and education for the hearing impaired. Uh, she arrived here in Hopewell Valley January 2001 starting at Bear Tavern as a basic skills teacher. Uh, during the 2002 expansion draft here in Hopewell, Dr. Fitzpatrick selected her to join Stony Brook as a first grade teacher. She performed so well in that first year that next year she was promoted right to fourth grade. Uh, so in about seven years ago, I had this crazy idea to switch her down to second grade. I thought that would drive her a little batty, and actually it did, because we now have a bat house at Stony Brook because of Mrs. Pizetzner's um, passion, newly found passion for bats. Um, as it turns out, it wasn't such a bad idea. Listen to a couple of quotes here from nominating letters. Mrs. Pizetzner met my daughter's individual learning needs in a multitude of ways. My daughter learned strategies from Mrs. Pizetzner that will last a lifetime. Mrs. Pizetzner knows how to get students excited about learning and eager to participate. With our world evolving in ways that can sometimes be a bit daunting, Mrs. Pizetzer taught skills beyond the academic setting. Self-responsibility, support for others, contribution to group efforts, and overall kindness. Her words were always gentle, yet firm, supportive, yet guided, and compassionate above all else. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present to you the recipient of the Governor's Teacher Recognition Award from Stony Brook Elementary School, Mrs. Michelle Pizetzner. From Bear Tavern, Chris Turnbull. Thank you, Mr. Souza. Good evening, Dr. Smith, Board of Education members, members of the central office, and good morning, or good afternoon, community. Um, I'd like to first congratulate all of, honor, all of our honorees this evening, as well as their families, because to be being talked about tonight, you clearly put a great deal of time effort and compassion into what you do. So family members, thank you for putting up with that and supporting all of the educators in our district. 
I have the distinct honor of congratulating Mrs. Donna Weidman tonight as the Bear Tavern Governor's Educator of the Year. She's been honing her craft at Bear Tavern for 29 years and has 30 years of experience in the field. And still after that time, she loves her students unconditionally. She works collaboratively with all of her families, sets a great example for all of her colleagues. What we do is critically important, and it's a really big deal, but how we do it is even more important. And every single day, Mrs. Weidman does what she does and meets the needs of her students with grace, with compassion, and with enthusiasm. And it's often said that kids or students or children are the most clear headed members of our society at times and sometimes can have the best insight uh, when having thoughts and coming forward. And one of the nominations that I'd like to share was written by a child and it was titled, Mrs. Weidman is the best. <laughs> in the nomination, the student who was in first grade actually quite a few years ago stated, I don't remember everything that she did with us, but I remember that she did it well. The student continued to say that Mrs. Weidman went out of her way to challenge her, providing unique assessments and experiences in math and writing just for her. That nomination concluded with, I would imagine that there are a lot of teachers that are good at their jobs and that care about their kids. But there are some that just stand out more than all the rest. For me, that one that stands out is Mrs. Weidman. My family and I loved the way that she teaches and how kind she is to everyone around her. But there is one gift that Mrs. Weidman always emphasized to me. She encouraged me to love learning and to share my love of learning with my family, my friends, and everyone that I meet. So again, I'd like to thank Mrs. Weidman, but also end on a personal note, because Mrs. Weidman was my son's teacher last year. And my wife picks him up after school each day, and oftentimes my cell phone will buzz. Say, where's Logan? Because every single day, Logan stops at Mrs. Weidman's classroom on the way out <laughs> to the parking lot just to say hello and just to um, spend a little bit of time. So even when he's told not to, he uh, <laughs> still tries to make his way. But, but that's the kind of um, personality that Mrs. Weidman has and the kind of impact that she has on everyone that she comes in contact with. So come on up, Mrs. Weidman, and congratulations. We're very proud of you. From Tollgate Grammar School, Dr. Faye Lewis. Good evening, Dr. Smith, members of the Board of Education, Hopewell Valley community members, and our honorees this evening. It is my pleasure to speak to you about Gillian Beck. Gillian Beck began teaching art at Tollgate Grammar School in 2013. Prior to assuming this role, she was employed as a substitute in the district. She is a proud product of HVRSD, having graduated from Central High School and continued her post-secondary education at Cutstown University of Pennsylvania, where she earned a BFA in studio art and painting. It is my pleasure to have Jillian on our staff. Jillian is quiet and humble, but she has an amazing gift that we are fortunate to have her impart upon children every single day. She has a true passion for her work and leads with this passion and love of art every single day. Following are just some of the sentiments shared by our TG families and our peers at about Mrs. Ms. Beck. Her projects are creative and inspiring. My children adore her and have been inspired by her love of teaching art. She is generous with her time. As a colleague of Jillian's, I find her to be compassionate and eager to collaborate. 
Ms. Beck always strives for a positive learning environment, learning environment for every single child. So please join me in congratulating Jillian Beck as Tollgate Grammar School's recipient of the Governor's Education of the Year Award. Congratulations, Jillian. From Timberlane Middle School, Nicole Gianfredi. Good evening, Dr. Smith, Board of Education, members of the Hopewell Valley community. Um, I'd like to extend my congratulations to all the winners this evening. It is my honor and privilege to congratulate Mr. Mark Armatia. Since joining the Timberlane family in 1996, Mr. Armatia has served as a social studies teacher. He has also been our on-site athletic director for many years. Throughout the building and the district, he is recognized as a passionate educator who works diligently to motivate children, making learning relevant, and transforming young lives. He truly cares about our students. With his classroom right across from the main office, I can personally say he is a pillar of Timberlane and somebody that we can all count on. Mark received many nominations from students, parents, staff members, sharing thoughts like this. I have never had a teacher that truly cares about each and every one of his students as much as he does. I know I can always ask Mr. A for help in and out of the classroom. Mark is often found in our PAL classroom, our practical academic learning classroom, which is for our students with some of the most significant learning, learning issues in our building. And while his teaching responsibilities never required him to be part of that classroom, he became part of the PAL family. As some of our PAL students diligently wrote, Mr. A knows our name, he always makes us smile, he's always helping, and he always brings in bird seed for the bird feeder. <laughs> Simply stated from one nomination, Mark is more than a teacher. He is a role model, he is a good citizen, he is altruistic, he is a team player, he is a mentor, and he is a friend. Congratulations, Mark. From Central High School, Tana Smith. Good evening, Dr. Smith, Ms. Murray, members of the board. And as has already been said this evening, congratulations to all of our honorees for the incredible work that you do each and every day for our students in Hopewell. Thank you. I've had the distinct privilege to work with Mr. Nicholas Johnson for the last two years at Central High School. Mr. Johnson has worked in the district for almost 10 years as a member of our science department teaching chemistry to our students. He also serves as the ski club advisor and the senior class advisor. He was part of the team that led the charge in creating an online professional development program for staff in the area of blended learning. Nick has led new teacher in-service sessions, was part of Hopewell's Connect Ed leadership team, and also taught for Camp Invention that was taught at Timberlane in the summer. Along with these many in-district experiences, Mr. Johnson has presented at the New Jersey Science Convention and the Conquest Program at Ryder University and currently serves as an educational research consultant at ETS. Whew, that's a lot. 
Mr. Johnson is truly an amazing person and educator who gives of his time. Here are some of the comments made by those that nominated him for Teacher of the Year. What a great teacher Mr. Johnson is. Mr. Johnson gave my son the confidence to make the effort in chemistry. Chemistry became my, my son's favorite subject, which says a lot because science was never his favorite. He makes the students feel valued even if they are not the best in the class. We are so lucky to have Mr. Johnson at the high school. I couldn't agree more. Please join me in congratulating Mr. Nick Johnson on this well-deserved honor. As Dr. Smith mentioned earlier, this year we started a new award and a new recognition program. And this doesn't have anything to do with the state of New Jersey. It came from Hopewell Valley. And quite honestly, it's an excellent way to recognize some of our other individuals who go above and beyond on a daily basis for our kids. We started this new pr program this year to recognize support staff professionals for their hard work and dedication to the district. Elig eligible candidates included paraprofessionals, secretaries, custodians, maintenance workers, bus drivers, van attendants, campus safety officers, and our technology department. A committee consisting of myself, Tom Quinn, our Director of Facilities, Paulette DiNardo, our Director of People Services, and Heather Van Mater, our Director of Transportation, reviewed nominations and selected individuals based on the following criteria. Dedication to their job, inspiring, and making a difference in the lives of staff, parents, and students. For our first year, we have three recipients, and we will be honoring them this evening. At this time, I will be inviting up the building principals to come up and introduce them. We will start off first from Tollgate Grammar, Dr. Lewis. Mrs. Halbeck. So Ms. Halbeck earned an associate's degree in humanities, social science from Mercer County Community College and has been employed as a paraprofessional in our school district since 2007. Over the course of those years, she has earned a reputation for being extremely flexible and for going above and beyond the call of duty. She is truly caring. She is unafraid to hug students when they need a little TLC. And she puts the needs of children first always. And. When assigned to our most challenging students, that is when her talents are truly magnified. Because inevitably, she is somehow able to help them turn things around. It is as though she has magical powers. And I wonder if she carries a magic wand in her purse. <laughs> so here are some of the sentiments shared by our TG families and peers about Ms. Hartbeck. No matter where Colleen is placed, she gives 100% and immediately becomes a valued member of that classroom. She bonds with each child she comes across. Her warm and engaging personality helps the students feel comfortable and motivated. She is very special due to her bubbly personality and the joy she brings to the classroom. She makes a difference in the lives of so many children. She is a pleasure to work with a friend to all in the building. She is a gem. So to say that Colleen is a gem is accurate, but doesn't quite provide you with the full picture of the magic that she spreads to our little ones at Tollgate. Please join me in congratulating Colleen Harbeck as HVRSD's recipient of the Support Staff Professional of the Year.
from Bear Tavern, Chris Turnbull. Good evening. It is my distinct pleasure tonight to recognize Mrs. Lauren Jordan, the school secretary at Bear Tavern, as the educational support professional of, or one of the educational support professionals of the year. And I could probably talk for 45 minutes or so if you guys, we can push with the budget. We just have the budget and violence and vandalism. Okay, no, but we will try to keep it brief, which will be difficult um, when talking about Mrs. Jordan. Uh, she is quite literally at the center of everything at Bear Tavern. She greets families warmly. She assists students, helps staff every single day. Her attention to detail is absolutely unparalleled. In fact, she can take my rudimentary and lackluster writing in memos and communications and make them robust and eloquent, <laughs> and has recently taught me the glories of the Oxford comma. <clears throat> but she energizes and she motivates every single person around her, including me. There's not a single day that goes by that I don't learn something from Mrs. Jordan. She truly makes me better. Not only is she a school secretary, but she is an active co-chair of our wellness committee. She is heavily involved in our DEN group implementation, planning, and operations. She doesn't hesitate to get her hands dirty throughout any process or activity that's going on at Bear Tavern. She makes our school into a community and a home. In Lauren's nomination, it was noted that she wears infinite hats at Bear Tavern and that she, she has institutional knowledge about the operation of the school that is invaluable, but what makes her special is that she honors the great traditions and history of Bear Tavern while also shaping an innovative, exciting, and creative future for the school. She's an integral part of the school's decision-making process in many areas. And I'd like to add that quite simply, Bear Tavern would not be Bear Tavern without Mrs. Jordan. She was instrumental in my transitioning there and is probably the reason I'm still employed there today. <laughs> but her art and her passion and her enthusiasm every single day makes our school special. So come on up, Mrs. Jordan, and thank you. And finally, from Timberland Middle School, Nicole Gianfredi. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> um, it is my distinct honor to announce Mr. Ali Young as one of the educational support professionals. Uh, Timberline is lucky to have two outstanding professionals this year, and Mr. Ali Young joined Timberline in 1999, and he became our head custodian in 2006. Ali is yet another pillar of Timberline. He is committed to the staff, the students, and the building. He is dedicated to his profession and takes pride in his work and is always smiling. Uh, in a recent safety meeting, Ali went out of his way to say that he would do almost anything to ensure the safety and to protect our students. He is a positive role model and res respected by the students. In fact, he has mentored several of our students. He is an amazing support and a friend. And as one staff member said, every single person in our building can do their job better because he does his so well. I can truly say that that statement speaks the truth. As a new principal, I don't know what I'd do without you, Ali. As one nomination stated, Ali is the heart of the building, and he truly is. Congratulations, Ali.
Let's, oh, the, so if you when we have two <laughs> riveting presentations coming up. One is our mid-year violence and vandalism <laughs> report. The other is the the budget. It's 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 interesting. You're, I'll let you go, but they read the highlights. Thank you, can you watch so it. much. It's a, Congratulations. Please, Please, please take something on your way out. Please take some food on the way out. Food. Cookies, or else we'll eat them. Please. <laughs> You're heading out as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, Carla, you, what? You don't want to see the, the boot on the e-learning? Anything? <laughs> Nothing? Come on, you're already uh, in the college. Coast? Coast? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. No more snow, right, Caroline? <laughs> it's a, it's like water. I was expecting Oreo. Oh, don't right take now. it with you. Yeah. Fire, fire. That's it. Done. You don't want to talk about what? I don't like that choice. Or but, uh, but I chose you. I. It's, that's why we're gonna discuss it. It. <laughs> Which we would have discussed. I know. It is. You know, I wish I wasn't impressed. Batteries impressed. I've not been impressed. Plus, any batteries other than this oh. while it's running. Mm-hmm. For some reason, I close it. Mm-hmm. Why do we do this? Off for a couple of weeks, the battery's gone. This I charge it for a few minutes. This thing will last a couple of years. No, I think we can. Sometimes it does. We might. We'll talk about it. No, I didn't see it. We have a month. Ready? Bless you. <coughs> Ready? Each year that we are uh, required to present the um, violence and vandalism reporting uh, for the district. Um, recently, they've changed that, and we have to present mid-year also. So um, we will present one again, and you will see Tony. <laughs> Uh, in the fall, who will present from the uh, total for this year, but this is a mid-year review, um, and I will turn it over to Mr. Suzo. Thank you, Dr. Smith. So mid-year, this includes all the incidents that occurred from the beginning of the school year through December. And as Dr. Smith said, I'll be reporting out in October for all the data for the 17-18 school year. So here's a breakdown of the different categories and obviously the different schools. So we have substance abuse offenses, vandalism, violence. Um, Within violence, you would see things like a threat or if there was some type of um, interaction between students that was physical in nature, uh, weapons, any harassment, intimidation, and bullying that was reported, meaning that there was an actual report filed and then any harassment, intimidation, and bullying reports that were confirmed based on the New Jersey state law that met the criteria. So you can see based on that, um, our numbers across the board as far as our totals and then for each particular school. This information just shows so far for 17-18, keep in mind the information you see on the left for 16-17 was for the total year. But based on whether it was a HIB or some of the other infractions that we saw on the previous slide, um, the types of consequences that were given by the school administration. If we look at trends, you will see again, uh, keep in mind 15, 16, and 16, 17 are the totals for the year. Um, But you can see where we are so far this year for 17, 18 in all the different categories.
This year, the state actually completely did an overhaul of their violence and vandalism reporting processes. Uh, we are now required beyond typical things that would fall under violence and vandalism. We are required to report anytime there is a HIB that um, is confirmed as a HIB or even if it's presented as a HIB, however, due to investigation, it's found not to be a HIB, we still have to report it. So you can see some of the breakdown of the different categories on this form as far as things that would fall under violence and vandalism, um, including HIB, which you see in the middle column. And just some more information. And as I mentioned, anytime there's a HIB report, we would then fill out this as part of the violence and vandalism process. And it provides information on the HIB, the type of HIB, if you look at the top, um, to perceive their distinguishing characteristic. And then when we talk about, you know, proactive programs for student safety, we've been doing a lot of work, as the board has heard about, in the community in reference to cultural competency and also character education throughout the district. Um, every school has a anti-bullying specialist, and in some cases more than one in their building. That is uh, individuals that I meet with as the district bullying coordinator, and we meet periodically throughout the year to take a look at HIB reports that were filed, ones that were confirmed, the trends across district, the trends in particular buildings, and then we also take a look at the educational programs to see whether or not we're meeting the students' needs. We are very fortunate, and we've talked about this before, to have counselors in all of our buildings to help support our students. We also have a campus safety officer in each one of our six schools, and we have an outstanding relationship with the Hopewell Township Police Department, which we work very closely with. We are fortunate as well to have a student assistance counselor at the high school and also one at the middle school who supports our elementary as well. Um, as I mentioned, our anti-bullying specialists. We also have a great relationship with Healthy Communities, Healthy Youth and have clubs and organizations and a lot of awareness programs throughout the year. We are required by the state of New Jersey to have a week of respect, which is the first week in October, and then also a week that focuses on violence and vandalism awareness, which is later in October. And some of you may recall, it seems like a while ago, but Rachel Simmons did come to our district back in November, spent some time with our parent community, and also worked with all of our students in grades 4 through 12 on issues of bullying, harassment, social media, and cyberbullying. Any questions? Yeah, one, one quick question. Um, we had talked last year about um, reducing the number of out-of-school suspensions, and I see that number's way down, um, but there's still a handful of them. Uh, is, is that just, you know, uh, particular cases, or are we looking for, you know, are we continuing to look for opportunities for in-school suspension? We are continuing to look for uh, opportunities for in-school suspension in certain cases. Um, because we have limited space, um, when you have two or three kids involved in a, in a situation, maybe one is on home instruction, one is here, uh, I'm sorry, one is on out of school suspension. It also depends on the severity of the incident also. No, I, I think it's a tremendous, yep. tremendous decrease in out of school suspensions, which I like. You know, ultimately you'd like to get that number as small as possible. Yep. I noticed the uh, number, and I understand that I'm comparing a full year to a partial year, but at this point last year, we had a tremendously high number of substance abuse cases, and right now we have two. Um, do we have any idea, like, why? We have, we have a few more that aren't on the report because they've happened since December, but not anything near 24. Okay. I think we have about four or five right now for the year don't really have any evidence of, of why they're down in particular. Okay. Um. In accordance with the provisions of the New Jersey Open Public Meetings Law Act, 
The Hopewell Valley Regional Board of Education has caused notice of this public hearing to be published by having the date, time, and place thereof communicated to the Hopewell Valley News, the Times, and the Trenton. Trentonian, sorry. <laughs> notice of this meeting was also sent to Comcast Cable and Verizon. I now. Um, I'd like to open public comment for the um, harassment, intimidation, and bullying report only. Anyone? Public comment is now closed. Um, I'd like a motion to accept the harassment, intimidation, and bullying report. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstain. <coughs> motion carries. Uh, now we have to the budget, then we have public comment. Continuing with our riveting presentations, tonight I present to you. Tony, can I have the clicker? Yep. Uh, the tentative budget for the 2018-2019 school year. Um, so I will go through this. The board will be asked to approve the tentative budget with the understanding that there is time between now and May 7th when the final budget is due to continue discussions. However, um, we have had our um, board budget retreat. We have had our governor's budget message. We've received our state aid figures. Um, we're asking you for a preliminary budget adoption, which will be sent to the county tomorrow, uh, assuming it is approved, and the board will have an opportunity to continue the discussion of the budget, um, and we will have a public hearing of the f and the final adoption of the budget um, on May 7th. I would like to just uh, say uh, an aside, um, I think, I hope everyone will be pleased of where we landed with the budget. But I would also let to, like to say that at any point, if anybody has any questions with specific information contained in this budget, uh, please reach out to either um, Bob Calavita or myself. We will go through line by line as much as you would like to, to see of the budget. Um, school budgets are complex. Um, we have a, there's a lot of information, but we will take the time to ensure that folks understand what that budget means. Um, so our, you know, just some quick things it's, as we see a budget, it really is a planning tool that reflects what we value as a school district. Um, so we have opportunities as a school district to really um, fund those programs that are important to us. As Tony said, we consider ourselves very fortunate to have a counselor in each school and to have a student assistance counselor in middle school and high school. Not all districts have that. Um, we also need to balance being fiscally responsible for those we serve. I think we've done that and we continue to try to do that through all of our, our budgets. Um, but ultimately, it's a planning tool. Um, we are budgeting one year out. Um, so if there is a spike in uh, fuel oil or, or something like that, um, we have to do our best guess on what we know. Um, and based on that, we all work together with, with the state and with the county to ensure that we are prepared. So, you know, as a district, we value providing opportunities for all students, underscoring all. Same with extracurricular and co-curricular opportunities. The board has been instrumental in making sure that we have opportunities for our students after the bell, um, not only during the bell. And I think they've, they've shown that. Um, we want to develop an entire child, not just being academically strong, but students who are good global citizens. We also want to support our staff to be um, excellent in their pursuit of education and pedagogy and the delivering education for our students. We want to have long-term planning for our academics, for our staff to address our aging facilities. We have a number of buildings that are nearing 100 years old, including this building and the Tollgate building. Um, and we want to make sure that we are consistent in our messaging. So just so you know, as we uh, build our budget, we not only look at our budget for next year, but the year after that. We know the decisions we make will impact us in the future. Um, so you also know that we've frozen our budget expenditures to generate surplus to apply towards next year's budget. Um, enrollment has stabilized, um, and we have no staff reductions as we have taken in the past due to enrollment reductions. Um, and we expect to have minimal retirements. 
health benefits are one area that remains volatile, um, and we will continue to look at that. But right now, increases are double digits in all facets of health care. And home values and rateables in the towns, two of our towns, have decreased. So that adds to the conversation. Quick terms, I won't go over each one of these, but you can uh, catch these in the presentation. But we use a lot of fancy terms in education, like tax levy, debt service, fund balance and surplus, bank cap, capital reserve. Um, these are all parts of the budget. They look at where we bring money in and where money goes. Um, and that's just a simple graphic of, you know, we have money coming in uh, and money going out. Salaries and benefits are our biggest driver, curriculum supporting our staff, facilities and maintenance. Um, and we get money from state funds, federal funds, property taxes, miscellaneous incomes, uh, and appropriated fund balance. So the revenues, where does our money come from? It comes from state funds, of which only 4% of our budget comes from state funds. Although we've had an increase, it still translates to about 4%. Federal funds, we receive about 1% of our budget comes from federal funds. The vast majority of our funding comes from local property taxes, which is really important of why we feel a strong responsibility to make sure that we are fiscally responsible with our budget. Um, fund balance, that is the money that comes out of either this year's budget or previous year's budgets. And miscellaneous revenue, that is the contributions towards health benefits, um, staff tuition. We do have tu staff members who send their children here, and that tuition goes into our budget. Um, we run our facilities, uh, we do charge some transportation, and we do get some grant monies. But the all in all, that totals about 1% of our total budget. Again, as I mentioned, um, the vast majority of our budget is salaries and benefits. On average, 75 cents of every dollar that we collect goes to pay for the salaries and benefits of our teaching staff. Um, keeping up with our facilities, as I mentioned, our facilities, many of our facilities are older, making sure that they are taken care of. In addition to the referendum work, just general maintenance. Making sure our curriculum is tight, our technology and our supplies are funded appropriately are also important in transportation, making sure that we are providing transportation to the students who need it the most. So that's just a, another representation, a bolded representation of where we are. 75% of our budget, 75% of our budget, I want to underscore that, increases over 2%. That includes benefits at a double digit increase. So we are capped at 2%, so how do we make up that difference is the question. Uh, special education is another large driver. It's important that we meet this, those students' needs, but they are costly programs. Making sure that we um, maintain our extra and co-curricular activities to the board's vision and our maintenance operation and transportation. Uh, here's just a fun slide looking at, we've tried to keep our budget over the years. Um, and we have an average budget increase of 1.8%, which is under the state cap. Benefits have increased uh, 7%. Salaries have increased over the cap. Um, the Dow Jones Industrial Average has increased 11.7%, and the CPI is the Consumer Price Index. So here's the, the information that people like to see is what is included in this year's budget. Salary increases for all existing staff members, health benefits increases, all existing programs and services and supports, flat or decreased discretionary spending in our budget lines. That's really what we have control over. That is the spending lines in our, our schools. Um, additional Chinese teacher, which was planned. Additional athletic trainer, which was planned as a build out of our programs. Busing for those students without a safe walking, uh, without safe walking travel to our school, we're restoring that, um, that had been out of place. Um, that really equates to about 65 students um, those are students on 31 and off of 31 that do not have a safe walking route to school. Um, and also an after school late bus run from Timber Lane and the middle school, we're looking at 530 um, for that bus run. So all of these are included in this year's budget that you will be presented with tonight. We still have other things that have uh, not been included at this time. The expansion of recitation at the high school. Um, fencing is an area of Fencing, that is the sport of fencing um, that has been shown in other districts to really uh, reach a, a large number of students who are not your traditional athletes. Um, bowling is another request. A concession stand, which is almost a national, an annual request. Um, the partial cost of a school resource officer, which was a question, is not in here. 
um, and any breakage at this point from staff. Breakage is simply when folks retire at a higher salary, um, we hire somebody at a lower salary um, that was uh, that comes in after the budget. All righty. So the the question we often get is, okay, so we look at your budget. What can we cut? As I mentioned, really 75% of our budget is made up of salaries and benefits. So any in any change to that, dramatic change in our budgeting, will impact programming and facilities. That means we would decrease staff and we would have larger class sizes. We could look at, and I'm not disparaging other districts, but some other districts you know, simply use Rosetta Stone um, on the elementary level for a world language program. We have a world language teacher in each elementary school. Um, I am proud to say that we are probably one of the most high achieving school districts that continues to have an operating auto shop and wood shop. We truly have a comprehensive high school. I support that. Um, and, but they are not cheap programs. They are expensive programs. Um, but again, it's something we value as a school district. Um, other districts have been faced with eliminating freshman teams or reducing their middle school teams to one. Um, that is where if we were forced to make reductions, we would look at. Um, and other things that we've worked very hard on professional de development to ensure consistency across our elementary program um, and our general improvements. We could cut back on professional development, but I fear that that would impact the quality of instruction in our schools. Again, potential reductions um, district-wide looking at areas. Uh, we're not making these recommendations, but as people question us, you know, do we look at our summer programming, um, which we are looking at? But again, that's it. That's a convenience for a lot of folks where they can meet with their uh, child study team um, person or the nurse or the guidance folks over the summer. Um, we're looking at trying to tweak that and move move that. Um, some districts have eliminated trips uh, in general. We're not saying that, but if we needed to make additional expenditure reductions, that's where we would look. Um, Things that are not necessarily educationally sound, but we can certainly make reductions. That is returning to multi-age grouping um, to balance class sizes, redistricting, um, reductions in art, music, or other specials. Again, if we want to uh, make significant reductions in the budget, you're impacting programs. The middle school, uh, teaming is an expensive concept, but I think it is a worthwhile one. But if we were forced in the situation to reduce our budget further, that's where we would look at after school enrichments that we provide. Um, the elimination of daily substitutes. I will say we are looking at this one as we speak um, in reducing our number of uh, substitutes at the high school. Um, we're specifically looking at, as I mentioned, auto shop and wood shop. Rather than having those students go to those classes, they would go to um, either the um, the media center or the um, cafeteria, thereby saving a sub for that day. Um, but we're looking at other classes, uh, for example, uh, chemistry, um, where the, the work that day is highly dependent on a teacher being able to access chemicals. Not recommending any of these, but just so you're aware of if we were to truly make significant cuts to this budget, we would be cutting programs. Another thing that I think uh, folks have come to value um, is our class sizes. Um, and balancing those class sizes become difficult when you have smaller schools. Um, two of our schools, uh, Tollgate, for example, and Hopewell, uh, I'm sorry, Bear Tavern, are two of our smaller schools, and the opportunity to balance those classes becomes difficult um, as you go over. These are our average grade, our class sizes for, uh, for next year, and here are our kindergarten enrollments as of um, last Friday. Um, so we'll continue to track these um, and make adjustments as necessary. But they are very favorable in comparison to other districts. Um, again, with the uh, six to eight class size averages, very fortunate to have class sizes um, in the low 20s. So here we are getting to the budget. Um, you can see these. I'll uh, skip right to the chase, um, which is what uh, folks typically ask for, is the general fund tax levy increase is below cap. We're bringing this to the board at this point at 1.75%. Um, I would like to um, really thank, well, 
I thank the state for giving us additional state aid. Um, but I'd also like to thank um, Mr. Calabita for his work um, in this and the board president and vice president for their guidance in developing this budget it is very helpful to have folks who know budgeting and to, to bring in a budget at this um, level. So this is what we're delivering to you. Um, for this, you can see our debt service. Um, bring that up. I want to hit uh, debt service. Well, I'll get that in a second. Um, this is how each section breaks out. The regular instruction, you can see a number of these benefits. Uh, regular instruction and special education are well over the 2% um, budget cap um, and transportation. Um, but we are able to balance that with additional state aid and utilizing funds from this year's budget and actually from last year's budget um, to offset these. So here you see the general fund tax levy history. So you get a five-year snapshot. Um, and I think you can. Uh, this is something as taxpayers um, we can deliver to you, um, I think, proudly that we have come in. And I ask you if you, if you don't feel that way to, to look at other school district budgets and look for the last four years to see if any other district has um, delivered a general fund increase of below 1% for two years and below 2% for two years. And our general fund increase this year, as I stated before, is 1.75. Our total tax levy increase is 1.22%. Is that accurate, Mr. Calavita? Um, another big uh, conversation folks have, uh, have um, reached out about is our debt service payment. So I think everyone is aware we passed a, um, a very strong referendum last year. Um, we knew that going into that, we still had about um, three years of debt for Stony Brook. That will be rolling off in 2021. And you can see the drop off here from um, our annual payment of $6,147,000 and change, decreasing to $5,700,000. And again, in 2022-23, decreasing again to $4.1 million. So this is helpful as we plan in our future, looking at our debt service payment is actually reducing as we, as we go forward. Um, again, so that should provide us opportunity as a district to look at our general layout of how we are budgeting. Um, something else you should just be aware of, as I mentioned, the use of fund balance to balance our budget. Mr. Calavita will give his public service announcement. Um, however, fund balance or monies left over from previous budgets that we're applying towards this budget. Um, we have an increasing number towards that. We would like to start to, to get away from using previous year's budgets to fund or offset increases of current year budgets. Um, however, in this case, we have the money and it's important that we deliver the programs and we offset the impact on our taxpayers. So again, that's what we're, we're delivering. Um, Bob's public service announcement, would you like to make it, Mr. Calavita? You did a good job. <laughs> I did a good job? All right. Bob says you shouldn't use surplus. Uh, <laughs> so here's the tax rate summary, and this is the um, how this impacts our uh, towns. So Hopewell Borough will see an increase. Hopewell Township will see an increase. Pennington Borough will see a decrease. Now, you will, I would like to note that regardless of where the budget landed, even if we developed a budget that came in at zero, these municipalities would still see an increase because of the decrease in rateables for those towns. So I'm going to shift on that real quick. So you can see the rateables of those particular towns, and that is the rateables are the house values, um, or I'm sorry, the overall property values of those specific, specific towns. Hopewell Veros have actually gone down um, the overall value of about $436,000. Hopewell Township's overall value has gone down about $4.4 .4 million. Pennington Borough's overall value is going up about uh, $31,000. The other part is the um, the budget share and enrollment. So Hopewell Borough and Hopewell Township's share of the budget has actually increased this year, um, and Pennington Borough's has de decreased. So regardless of whether we landed the budget, th these are things that are without, uh, outside of our control. These are determined by the Mercer County Tax Assessor's Office. Mr. Marty Gould, Bob can give you his phone number if you'd like. Uh, I'm giving his phone number. Um, but <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. 
Um, but we've had Marty present here on a number of occasions um, because our, our setup is somewhat unique with having three towns um, and the, the way that the budget share is laid out. Uh, but with the volatile housing market, as hopefully it will continue to increase, hopefully we'll see this change, particularly the rateables. Um, but the percentage share is something that, that fluctuates from year to year. And regardless of where we deliver a budget, these are uh, far larger factors on the impact of taxes. Uh, something else so you're aware of bank cap salary, uh, bank cap history, these are the amounts um, that we come in under the budget that are available to the board should they want to use them in the future. Um, so I would like to, to segue as part of this budget conversation um, to make a recommendation to the board, um, although it's not part of the budget, but just so you're aware of, um, we'll be making recommendations to uh, for our capital reserve to make withdrawals mm -hmm. to fund some of our added security efforts. So I want to give make sure that everybody is aware that we do have a district safety committee that meets regularly. Uh, that's comprised of the um, emergency management folks from the township, the police officers, um, our campus safety officers and, uh, officers and our school district staff. Um, we meet regularly to look at how we can better secure our buildings. Um, we also debrief incidents. We debrief incidents that take place in our district and those that take place outside of our district to review. Um, so since um, the recent incident at the high school and also at the, the parkland, um, we are requesting a state security audit because it's always good, although we have a district safety committee um, and we have a number of individuals in our community who are quite adroit at um, security, it's really helpful for us to have a objective third party coming in and um, reviewing what we're doing and how we're doing it. I recently met with the prosecutor and the Mercer County Rapid Response Group, um, and that is a team of police officers from around the county who will come whenever there's an incident. Um, and because of um, Hopewell Valley, um, and we actually comprise about 62 square miles, the opportunity for a police officer to get to one of our schools in a timely manner should uh, could be compromised, and it might be an opportunity where a Ewing police officer is closer. So this um, rapid response group is coordinating all of that. Um, I think everyone is aware we're decreasing and limiting access to our buildings. We will continue to work through that. Um, we're looking to train our staff. Um, Alice training is one of the most, um, uh, the more popular trainings uh, right now, up our training and increasing our training for our CSOs. We're also looking at reframing our CSO position. That means specifically providing them with advanced training, providing them with cell phones, um, making sure that they are not really you know, and this might, uh, you know, upset some folks, but, you know, our CSOs have done some nice work um, in getting to know the kids, but should they be, you know, coordinating games out on the recess versus limiting on, on, the, on the playground versus really monitoring how they are, uh, how we are letting people in and out of our buildings. So we're looking at reframing that discussion. Um, so we're also looking at, as, as it related to my, my other thing about, um, the Mercer County Rapid Response Group. We're geomapping our buildings, which will provide a gridded response area for that's for particularly for people who have not been in our building. This provides a quick and easy way to uh, provide locations. And as I mentioned, providing the CSO positions uh, with cell phones is not only will that aid in communication, but once we we enact these digital maps, you will be able to tell where they are at any minute of the day. Um, should we have an incident. Same thing with police officers. Once they enter our building, we will be able to digitally tell where they are within our buildings. So a couple things um, based on our most recent experience. I think everybody is aware that we've lost power in a number of buildings over the last couple of months. We are making a recommendation out of our capital with uh, reserves to fund generators from all of our buildings. And I'll show you that specifically. Changes to our building entrances, including vestibules. Um, and adding additional cameras and swipes to our buildings. Um, this is that geo mapping that I was talking about. This is not our school, but that provides an opportunity for, uh, for folks to, um, and this would be housed, and this is just a sample, this would be housed um, in a secure environment and only through the prosecu access through the prosecutor's office. But for example, if there is an incident 
you could tell this person, you could tell if a Ewing police officer was coming in that there's an intruder in sector D5. Um, if we said, hey, go to the cafeteria, that would mean nothing to an officer coming from Ewing. But if they have this geo map and, they could, and we say there's someone in sector D5, they will have an opportunity to know exactly where that is. Inexpensive. This, um, the schools in Merce County are doing this, and I think this can really assist us with the rapid response um, in the case that there was an incident. Um, so long story short about what I was talking ab about, we're at now I'd like to underscore that this does not impact the budget at all. These are capital reserve monies. These are monies that we have been saving um, for projects. We're recommending generators at Bear Tavern. Hopewell Elementary School, Tollgate, and TMS. TMS already has a generator. It's an undersized generator. We would like to increase, um, add another generator. The importance of this is threefold. One is making sure that we can have communication uh, during the time of emergency. Also making sure that we can uh, light areas of, um, of refuge. Um, for example, that these would, um, we would have lighting, emergency lighting, um, in the gymnasium, in the cafeteria. So these can also act as warming stations in the event for the township or for residents. If we had another long-term power outage uh, in the community, they could come here warm and charge their devices um, because our generators would be going through that. Um, one of the things we've learned is, is Bear Tavern um, lost power. They don't have a backup generator. The phones went down. The computers went down. There was no way to communicate with parents um, in a wide scale. So that, that principal was left to contacting me, whom we are trying to set out um, text messages through the phone, because at that time, we had actually lost power um, through that. So this will help in terms of that communication. Also looking at building improvements, vestibules, um, improving um, specifically Bear Tavern uh, with a vestibule and looking at uh, Timberlane as, and Stony Brook adding a, lock, a locking vestibule, a, another set of locks. Um, the high school through the referendum that was already planned um, to increase security in terms of that entrance. Um, and also um, security cameras and door upgrades. Looking at um, alarming some of our doors um, at the high school, I think at last count, Mr. Calavita, we have 56 doors that open to the outside, alarming some of those. So if somebody opens a door that's not authorized, an alarm will go off and increasing our security cameras so we are aware of where and when folks are in our buildings. I think that is the end of my budget presentation. I'll go back to the, the budget part um, and I will entertain any questions that the, the Board of Education um, might have regarding our presentation. I leave you with um, two things. One is the what is included in this budget. Um, the new things that um, are included are, uh, um, again, existing programs and staff, but additional Chinese teacher, additional a point four of the Chinese teacher to build out position out to full time, additional um, portion of an athletic trainer that will build that position out to be um, full time, busing for those students without a safe walking without safe walking travel to um, school. That's 65 students that we've identified, and adding after school our late bus runs from the uh, Timberlane and the high school at 5.30. We're also looking in combination with that with the principals of providing some sort of homework help during that time for students say they're in an activity it ends at four o'clock that they could actually get some homework help from four to 5.30. Um, and all of that is brought to you within uh, not only un, uh, within cap but under cap at what point uh, seven five percent. I'm done. Um, I just wanted to clarify something on the locking vestibules. Are we looking to do that in all of our schools? Um, yes. At Tollgate and Hopewell Elementary, we're working with the police um, and we're hopefully getting some, uh, some advice from the state audit about how to better support those. They are really not conducive to vestibules simply building a wall, but looking at those stair towers at how we can better lock those down. I had two questions, Dr. Smith. Um, let's see. Uh, first, with regard to uh, the state audit of our security, yep. uh, do we have a schedule 
as to when that might occur? No. no not at this time. Not at this time. We're, I, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think they've been inundated with that. But we do have some folks who have said that um, they will help us make sure that we are scheduled in a timely manner. Okay. Um, my second question relates to the late bus run. Yep. Um, I would assume that doesn't run to every stop in the district. So Correct. So could you elaborate on where those stops might be first? And then the, I guess the second part of my question, there was a lot of discussion about what's the appropriate time to do it and what's the utilization. So do you have a plan for monitoring utilization of that bus run to make sure that it's being used effectively and if we found no one was using it, we might discontinue it? Correct. So uh, two excellent questions. Um, so we do have a plan, and we've spoken to um, Heather um, ben Matter, our director of transportation, about specifically monitoring how many kids are using it, literally with a clicker, um, how often, um, and which bus runs. So right now that um, we have had discussions about the stops, they're looking at where the students currently are, clusters of where students are, and trying to find spots that are um, as close to as possible to those. But you are right, they're not going to be the current number of spots that they have. They would be um, more localized. Um, but that's going to be based on, you know, they, they actually have a satellite program, and they can see there's clusters of students or high school and middle school students here. It would make sense to put a stop right here. Okay, so it might not be you know, bringing you right to, to your neighborhood stop, but it might be much more convenient in terms of location that a child could either walk to or be picked Correct. up from Correct, correct. Okay. There was an estimate of approximately how many buses it would take to do this late bus run. Nine? Nine. Nine buses. Nine buses. So I, I got a question on, this, on the same topic. When we had our retreat, um, <coughs> this wasn't on the included part of the budget. Um, I understand we got more in state aid than we expected, um, but I'm not sure that this is the right priority. I mean, I'm not convinced by the survey we did that we'll get the utilization numbers we need. In my opinion, um, some of the other things, right? You know, I gave the example of the, uh, the expanded recitation at the high school for science and math. I think just, again, in my opinion, is a better spend um, of the money. But I'm concerned that we've put something into the budget that we really didn't kind of all agree to um, at the works at, at, at the uh, work session and we really haven't kind of weighed out everything else in terms of a priority list um, maybe that's a long-winded statement but you know it, it, I find it odd that it's in here when we talked about it not being in here a week ago how much is it how much does it cost seventy five thousand dollars And to, to Bob's warning, Bob's point, I'd rather see you know us use seventy five thousand dollars less of surplus mm. than, than, than put something in that we're not convinced we need, unless everybody else is convinced we need it. So I think that, that you know it made it back in after the the conversations. We're recommending this. Certainly, it's up to the board's discretion to to not take one of our recommendations. Um, this has been on the table for a, a number of years in conversations with. Our administration, the middle school administrator specifically, um, we have a number of lower income students that don't have an opportunity to participate in some of our programs. We would like to see if this will increase that participation. Um, so my recommendation is including this for this year and with the understanding that we will monitor it closely to determine if it would continue. In terms of uh, recitation, uh, Tana Smith has a group at the high school working at trying to find some found time in the schedule that will equate what is at the middle school, the flex time at the, the middle school, which should kind of bolster and change up our recitation and our belief in trying to provide kids with extra support. Um, so that'll take place over, over this year. So there, I think there's, you know, why we didn't act on the recitation at this point, because I think we're gonna try to come up with a plan to provide kids support within, uh, within the school day, um, but um, also to see, you know, it, it, it really will be an experiment. We have a survey, um, we have interest, we have people who are interested, we have an administrator who supports it, um, the after school bus run, and looking at it and see if kids, kids take it. But 
not to not to be anti-government, given that no. this is a governmental. Um, once once something gets put in, it tends to stay in, right? You know, we, it took us several years to pull out the uh, uh, the fee uh, for co-curriculars, mm -hmm. uh, extracurriculars. Um, I'm concerned that if we put this in, especially in this format where it doesn't it doesn't really meet the needs of the kids uh, participating in after-school activities at Timberlane, for example. They may still have an hour wait, mm -hmm. an hour and a half wait for this bus, nor does it really meet some of the needs of the kids at the high school who don't get done practice until 6 o'clock, right? So we've kind of split it down the middle here, and I'm not sure that you're going to get the increased levels of participation that you want for those two reasons. So in talking to the, the building principal, she thinks that, that we could develop a program that specifically those at-risk kids that we could provide them some almost support services that not only they could provide uh, be involved in enrichments they could um, get extra homework help so that was the uh, hurts thinking through that one um, the other thing about the you know the the practices there's a lot of discussion and I don't know where we'll land on this about limiting practice time um, do you make a hard stop at 530 um, with this our our principal our, I'm sorry our coaches then forced to say okay Kids need to be on the 5:30 bus. Yeah, but to get on a 5:30 bus, you're out of practice by five o'clock, mm -hmm. right? You got to get back to the locker room, you got to mm -hmm. shower, and you got to get on the bus. Yep. Right. So now you're cutting practice, which is currently three hours down to two. Yeah. I, I I just don't yep. I, I don't think there's all the pieces are here to kind of put seventy five thousand dollars into the budget that we don't know that we need. Is the uh, I just had a question about the timing. I mean, I know. Right now, we're just preliminary here, but the 5.30 time, I mean, and this set in stone, I mean, like... No, it's not set in stone. Yeah, yeah we could run a 4.30 I think just to run I the 4.30 that, bus. I mean, I look at it as I, growing up, didn't have the ability to do things like this because of this one little item here. And I can imagine there might be many others like that um, where if we're really hammering down on our equity, I think this is an area that we could... We could provide more equity for children. Not like me. I mean, you don't want to give me anything, but I'm just saying. <laughs> in general, there are other kids out there that may have an opportunity. And you know, if metrics, if we if we analyze those metrics, you know, and we are 50, 60 percent utilization, uh, and it's trending up, then then great, we made a great decision. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, like what Michael was saying, this might be something that never goes away or never gets used. But I think it's worth us trying. So, and just to, to your point, Mo, Michael, it, it was taken out, and this is just replacing it. So, late bus runs ran for a number of years. And oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Do we have the flexibility in terms of our fleet to do things like use vans in lieu of? Like yeah, I think buses? that. I mean, that's what that we had talked about, depending on the number of students who, who do it. So when, when do we, if we vote yes on this tonight, a tentative budget, is there still time to look at this and, and have one more discussion about Got it? Got an April retreat. Okay. <laughs> Could probably abstain tonight. Don't be offended. <laughs> <laughs> You'd never offend me, Mr. Markle. <laughs> or Tom. <laughs> Would you like to? Um. I just want to um, thank the administration for um, really taking the time to listen to all of our requests. We tend to continue to ask them to add to our budget because we want to ensure that we're, um, we're educating the whole child and we're creating access to kids who, ch who wouldn't have access otherwise. Yet, we've asked them to come uh, at well below the budget cap. So um, I wanted to thank you for your efforts. And um, we do have more time to discuss this, but we have to um, decide on um, voting on this budget for um, submission. Um, should I make, make a roll call? No, public comment. OK. Um, I'd like to, motion, to make a motion to um, um, accept the proposed budget. So moved. Second. Um, Roll call vote, please. Wait, you don't need to do a public oh. comment for the budget? 
Mr. D. Donato. Yes. Ms. Long. Yes. Mr. Markulek. I'm going to abstain. Ms. Peterson. Yes. Uh, Mr. Swicky. Yes. Ms. Tracy. Yes. Ms. Wolf. Yes. And Ms. Murray. Yes. And motion carries. Members of the public are invited to address the board on any matter for a maximum of three minutes during this portion of the meeting. You are asked to state your name, address, and municipality. In response to your comments, the Board of Education may respond or direct the superintendent to do so. The board may also opt to take the matter up at a future meeting so that the matter is researched by the district administration. Open public, open comment is now open. Good evening, my name is Catherine Fulmer Hogan and I live at 101 Ingleside Avenue in Pennington, New Jersey. I know you guys are probably tired of seeing my face <laughs> up here, but I'm delighted to see that uh, hazardous busing is included in the budget. As you know, that's something that impacts several of us in the community. I did see that the number is 65 students. I'm curious um, how, you know, where that number came from because I think initially the number was quite a bit larger. So I didn't know if there would be information available to the public as to how that was determined. Um, I'd also like to say that I am a graduate of the high school and I'm a product of late busing. And I appreciate that that's been included in this year's budget. I do have concerns, again, as someone who's impacted by hazardous busing, I know there'll be limited stops. Um, but if you live in an area that's hazardous, you're talking about buses dropping off in the evening when it's dark, I have a lacrosse player in the house and I have concerns about group stops where my son will suddenly be walking in the dark from a potential grouped stop. Um, so I'm hoping you can provide further information on that as well. Anyone else for public comment? Seeing none? Uh, I think there's more. Oh. oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Annabelle Davis. I live at 71 West Broad Street in Hopewell Borough. Um, and I'm here to speak out. I'm not sure if this is something that the board is considering against um, arming teachers or other staff members as a measure to prevent further school shootings. I think that throwing guns at what is a gun problem is the wrong way to go. Um, and turning our teachers into surrogate police officers will cause more harm than it will prevent. Uh, studies from the New York Police Department have shown that in an active shooter situation, uh, accuracy is around 20%, sometimes lower. Um, it's also sometimes a fact that in an active shooter situation, uh, police aren't equipped to deal with it, such as what happened in Princeton when SWAT teams and FBI were called. Um, in addition, there are also instances of police uh, accidentally shooting people that are not actually threats. So I think that when we give teachers weapons and the means to do that, it is going to create a lot more situations where there are questions of liability and questions of violence. And if a student pulls a gun and isn't shooting, does the teacher have to confront the student physically? Do they not have to? So I think that uh, what Hopewell needs to do is to look at the roots of what these problems might be. And I think that mental health care and social development is really important. I could name two students in the past three months that have tried to take their own lives. Um, and if you gave me a lineup of my class, I could point out 20 people that either physically harm themselves or have an eating disorder. Um, and the school either isn't aware of these uh, or for some of these students just don't do anything to intervene and their parents aren't doing anything. So I believe that while this is not the only cause of shooter situations and other violent instances in schools that this is something that needs to be addressed so if Hopewell is looking to minimize the likelihood of these events I would strongly uh, advocate for increased mental health support in particularly the middle school and high school.
Hi, um, my name is Jason Shepard. I live at 7 Princeton Avenue, Hopewell, New Jersey. Um, this weekend I attended the March for Our Lives in Washington, D.C. and I, there I saw kids from preschool through college unite to fight for something that we all believe to be a matter of life and death. And it's, it's the fear of the presence of guns. It's, it's something that hangs over the heads of nearly every student across the nation. Um, I think that it should be observed that guns don't serve as a remedy to school shootings. And I know this is something that's been heavily discussed in the past, but um, any presence of a firearm in schools um, brings students to a fear of being shot, whether it's an accidental discharge of a weapon or a mistake of someone's in intentions or identity. Um, the fact that weapons will potentially only be in the hands of a trusted officer is really hardly reassuring um, because the margin for human error is extremely slim and when there's a loaded firearm in a school, a student's chances of being shot rises really dramatically. Um, it also opens a door to an already exposed problem with officers um, unnecessarily using their firearms against minorities. Um, and I don't think that we as a community should allow this to um, fester in, in our schools. Um, I think that instead of establishing any sort of armed presence in or around our schools, there should be a heavier focus on keeping anybody who would seek to do harm out of the school um, in the first place. Fewer, more secure entrances and a better system for keeping track of guests would do the schools uh, and the students much better than having someone ready to take lives be the first thing that each student sees at school every day. Um, when all is said and done, it just comes down to one simple question. Uh, do we want Hopewell's youths um, residing in hallways that armed security officers patrol, or do we want them residing in a school without any fear of firearms, regardless of how those firearms are being used? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, I'm Julia Rubin. I live at One Woodlawn Lane. I'm a junior at Hope Valley Central High School. Um, and I'd like to just continue um, this discussion about arming teachers. Um, I find this proposal um, unnecessary. I really commend the board and the high school for the security protocols they've put in place to make students, teachers, and everyone in the building safer. I know at Hopo Valley, um, we've put in protocols to limit entrances, um, put teachers in front of all the entrances, and really make um, the school more secure um, via the swipe cards. And I think these protocols are um, well balanced when it comes to personal safety and security, and the extent to which um, security protocols can go to protect students. Um, I think there must be this balance because introducing guns into the big debate, as other speakers have already talked about, really introduces complications that would go well beyond their benefits of perhaps the slim chance that there is a school shooting or these people or, or a school shooter gets beyond, for example, the teacher at the entrance or the swipe cards or the vestibule. Um, having teachers armed would only enhance the danger in these situations. Um, not only could it be dangerous, and there are many logistical issues, such as like where these guns would be kept, um, what are the obligations in case of a shooting that the teacher has, um, but it also really introduces um, uh, complications unnecessary. Um, for all these considerations and more, I would like to reiterate that the school board has done an excellent job in balancing the personal safety and security of the students with as much um, security as possible. Um, so I don't think that arming teachers would really enhance these measures any more than they already are. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come up and speak? Okay. Um, so I just Dr. Smith, would you like to respond? Yeah, I think so. Um, public comment is now closed. Sure. Um, so uh, th uh, if I could just, let me take the uh, quick one. Um, Ms. Hogan, thanks. Uh, we, are, um, we looked at those uh, roads that could not be traveled safely. 
Um, so there's, you know, our definition of what hazardous busing was was not necessarily a true representation of what was truly hazardous busing. So we're happy to share if you want to come in. Again, I haven't seen you in a long time. If you want to come in and uh, share, but it, we really, that's where we made the delineation, uh, went out and drove areas. It's specifically where there was no method of safe travel um, and replacing busing for all that because I think the board agreed and the administration agreed that every kid should have safe travel to school versus those folks who had safe travel but chose not to, uh, are choosing not to take that. Although we classified that technically as hazardous, it was not hazardous by definition. All the stuff that we've kind of talked about. So we can, if, feel free to make an appointment. I'd be happy to sit down with you. Um, on a more serious note, I would like to just say um, that I witnessed the student um, protest or walkout or vigil, um, depending on who you spoke to, um, in our district. And I wasn't really prepared for how emotional it was, um, it would be for me. As somebody who, you know, and I, I told a, a story, and it was a true story, that w when I was in high school, we threatened to walk out because they, they were going to stop selling ice cream from our, our cafeteria. Um, and now the kids are dealing with some heavy-duty stuff. Um, and to see our students, and I counted, you know, 600 students walked out onto the, the turf field and another hundreds lined uh, the, the hallways at the high school caring, caring about losing a student, worried about security. And that was just something that was overwhelming for me. Um, and just the, the tremendous responsibility I feel, and I know the board feels this, the responsibility that we feel for our students. And we want to make sure that they have that. And you're truly growing up in a different time. And I'm, I can't make excuses for that because it just is. Um, the things that other students never had to face. Um, and I, I, went, I saw a video today of one of our students speaking at the rally in Philadelphia. Um, and just Ethan's speaking. Right yeah, I know. I pointed, I pointed <laughs> out. And I didn't want to. I'm sorry, Ethan, here you got there. He was trying to play low key. I just yeah. pointed at him, let him know I knew it was him. But, <laughs> but just, uh, you know, to see that and with the passion you spoke in front of all those students, I mean, that was really just impressive so we are all faced with trying to balance make that balance and i think that was a great way to put it um, and try to protect our students protect our schools and protect our staff um, i could say one thing i mean of all the recommendations and i think you saw my recommendations there they are specific to facility at this point um, i do think we need to look at how our cso's are used before any other conversation takes place but the no, there's no conversation, no recommendation coming from me or anybody that the teachers are going to be carrying guns. That's just not, it's not even on our radar, on our discussion point. Um, you know, and that's, we're, we're going to try to look at all of this in a balanced, uh, I think, um, understanding way as, as the board president started. Um, folks move into Hopewell with an expectation. Um, and I think it is our role to keep that expectation. But we do need to look at how we do things. We have our buildings are used almost 24-7. Um, can we do things to better limit access in the evenings or have some sort of mechanism for folks when they come in, even if it's a rec basketball game, that they're coming into our buildings, that they're assured that um, we know who they are and why they're there. Um, so, you know, at this point, we're, bless you, we're just trying to get a handle on access and controlling that access um, before we, I think the board is, and I think the board, as you said in the beginning, and I don't know if folks were here to hear that, is want to really make it, make this a community conversation about where we go. Um, but my recommendations at this point are securing our facilities better, better training our staff, not including guns, uh, <laughs> but just better training our staff just to react. One of the things is just a simple, um, training of, of what ifs and and I think the students can attest you know we've been doing lockdown drills for years um, a lot of a lot of us just walk through them um, but have we really gotten to the point where do we take those more seriously and look through them um, so at this point I mean there's no recommendation on our table to do anything on the table to do anything more than than what we're I'm suggesting about better training for CSOs better training for staff um, and securing our facilities more. 
I think there's a commitment on the, on, at least from the board president, about continuing the discussion, having the state come in and do a security audit, a third party, and looking at what we're doing. But I, I make no further recommendation at this point. Thank you. But I, I, I want to just underscore again the folks that, you know, and, and the kids, millennials, I'm sorry, you get a lot of grief, you know, on the Internet about, but just in the last month, if you know any high school student, um, it's just been really a powerful experience. And if you have a chance, and now I'll throw you under the bus, Ethan, Google Ethan Block Philadelphia uh, March and see his speech, it's about seven minutes long, um, standing in front of thousands of people um, and putting it out there. I mean, that's what we want from our students, um, to believe in a cause and to get up in front of thousands of people and, and speak about it. I mean, that is, it saddens me that kids are at that point, um, but it really makes me proud that you represent our district so well. So thank you. Yeah, and I'd like to comment on the people who did come here today and came and spoke in front of tens of people. Um, for uh, our students who came up today to speak to the board, um, I understand that you had a bit of a wait to, to do this. I'm sure you have homework to do, and I'm glad that it was important enough to you to come out and speak to the board. Um, I really appreciate all of you coming and speaking to us. I'd like to maybe finally say something about not just you guys who are speaking up here, um, but the many kids that have been speaking for the last month and a half, um, and having witnessed the walkout and listening to the kids on the turf um, speaking about their concerns. I know one of the things I want you all to know is that we hear your voices. Um, it's rolling around in my head when I'm not sleeping at night. Um, I can tell you that sometimes the, the voices we're hearing might be, oh, well, they don't, you know, we don't want them to stop us. We don't want them to tell us what to do. And if we ever seem as though we're trying to do something and you're feeling like it's not what you want us to do, just know that in our hearts and in our minds and in our heads, we're constantly thinking of what we think is best for you as adults. Um, but we understand that you as young adults are really figuring some things out that maybe we don't understand and we're here to hear that. So thank you very much. As this has been going on for the last couple of weeks, it almost makes me think this is gonna be this generation's 9-11 because most of these kids, if any of them weren't even born yet when 9-11 happened and I know how it changed me um, you know I don't miss a fire drill ever anymore I know where every fire exit is and getting stuck in a building once and almost not getting out was not something I want to repeat so I think you know these guys are gonna have that same sort of transformative experience potentially <laughs> where you know they they understand the risk they figure out how to deal with it and they're gonna make changes and I think this is we're gonna be looking back in 15 or 17 years, you know, like we are now at 9-11, and we're going to see this as a time that just changed many things in our country, and, you know, we're getting support all over the world. There were marches all over, you know, everywhere, not just in the U.S., in support of us. So I commend you guys, and, and keep it, keep up the good work, and just uh, keep moving forward, because you can be that change. You can make it happen. Okay. Anything else anyone wants to add? I guess we're moving on. <laughs> Tough to do after that conversation. Um, do we have um, any items of old business? All right. Consent agenda. Another late night for the Dizonados. <laughs> or early. <laughs> I just mentioned it. Does anybody want anything removed from the consent agenda? I'd like to. I need a motion to. Um, 
accept the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstain. Motion carries. Okay. Wow. This is <laughs> finance and facilities. Mr. DiDonato, you're on. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I guess. Would you, do you have any items to move? Yes, I have uh, two items to move. Uh, I think they're 13 and 14. 14 and 15. <laughs> oh, 14 and 15, okay. It's 13, 14 here, 14, 15 there. Second. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're basically just bid awards. Uh, the two items are for the, the roof bid. Uh, a couple of our final bids, uh, the tallies came in. The numbers are really good, actually exactly what we expected. Uh, for the roof at, over at uh, Tollgate and Timberlane and the HVAC over at Timberlane. Uh, so those items look good. We, uh, so I definitely, uh, I am moving those two items, 14 and 15. Michael seconded. Second. Yeah. Michael seconded before <laughs> there was All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstain. <laughs> Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, personnel. Mr. Suzo. Do we need to make a motion? Yeah, you need a motion. I know. Yeah, yeah. That's why I asked. <laughs> <laughs> no, me. So moved. Second. Second. Um, one item I would like to highlight on our agenda this evening, and that is the retirement of Elsie Mutner, paraprofessional at Hope Elementary, who's been with us since 1976, which is absolutely amazing. So, you know, I think last month we had one of our paraprofessionals from there as well who was leaving with over 40 years. So, <laughs> We just thank her for all the work that she's done um, and all the generations of kids that she's helped support throughout her career. Just a couple other things we talked about at personnel. We continued to examine teacher attendance and any trends in that area. And we also walked through with the personnel committee our non-tenure review process, um, which is an extensive process. And at our April meeting, we'll be making recommendations to the board for our renewals. Thank you, Mr. Suzo. I need a roll call vote, please. Ms. Long? Yes. Mr. Markulak? Yes. Ms. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Swicky? Yes. Ms. Tracy? Yes. Ms. Wolf? Yes. Mr. DiDonato? Yes. Ms. Murray? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, Ed Program, do you have anything to move, Jenny? I do. So I will move it to item number seven. It says report that the statute curriculum. I don't know if that needs to be changed before anything happens, but it's the curriculum. Second. <laughs> Go on. We don't have to change that. You could just tell them what it is. Right. No, you're allowed to keep talking. Now oh. we just have no, to. No, don't talk. No. <laughs> <laughs> talk. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to talk about it. Sorry, but I have to tell you that um, the curriculum uh, we had Beverly Mills and um, Bob, what is it? Elaine uh, Bob come in. They are so unbelievably awesome. And they are helping write the curriculum. They're the people who founded the um, Sourland African American Museum. And we are so fortunate to have them that that cannot go without being said um, before we have that vote. Where is that museum? It's uh, in Skillman. Okay. I don't know. I've never it, it just, well, they, it's, it, I think it's actually just opened. Yeah. And, um, and they actually got it um, listed as a federal. Oh, uh, historical places? Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, and they are, um, Beverly Mills is also uh, on Pennington Borough Council, mm -hmm. and um, her and Elaine have written a book, and I mean, they are just legends around here, and they're amazing, and we are so lucky to have them who are uh, to actually not only help us write the um, curriculum, but they're going to come in and, and, and speak with our students, and they are going to be so fortunate that they'll be able to get that exposure, so that, that needs to be said. Say that they, they funded the writing of the curriculum. They were a grant to pay the teachers to do that. And it's pretty cool because it's already in our curriculum that they talk about Hopewell um, history and culture. I remember when my kids were in third, fourth grade and they went to all these places, mm -hmm. but um, the African American history was never included in there before. And there's a pretty rich history around here, and it's pretty cool that we're going to get everything from there with people who have the history and the knowledge already specifically to this place. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I'll also add that one of our Governor Teachers of the Year award winners, uh, Mark Amantia, he was um, part of this process. Right. And you could just tell the passion he had for it um, 
which I think is also a big part of making this successful. Okay. Need a roll call. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Markulek? Yes. Ms. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Sawicki? Yes. Ms. Tracy? Yes. Ms. Wolf? Yes. Mr. DiDonato? Yes. Ms. Long? Yes. Ms. Murray? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Mr. Sawicki, do you have anything? Anything for community relations? Nope. No. Okay. Policies. Uh, first reading, we have uh, four policies on for first reading. Uh, policy 5332, which is a do not resuscitate order. Uh, we've got uh, two related to bus procedures, regulation uh, 60, 60, boy, I can't even see now, 8630 and uh, <laughs> policy 8630. So you're moving that? Uh, we're going to be moving all these as well as regulation 5330 for administration of medication. Most of these are related to uh, our policy services mandated changes. So we are recommending uh, adoption of these for first reading. Second. Thank you. <laughs> Any discussion? Okay. May I have a voice vote, please? Voice vote, please. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstain? Okay. Motion Second please. reading, we have five items. Uh, our drone pol new drone policy, thanks to Dr. Smith for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be watching everybody. I was okay. just <laughs> commenting on the, the news headline that I was banning drones. From. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, two related to uh, student health services and two related to bil bilingual education. These have not changed since the first reading, so uh, we are recommending their adoption via second reading. Second. Okay, all those in favor? No, these no. are oh, roll call on this one. one. Any comments? You didn't give me a cheat sheet on this one. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, any discussion before we vote? If I could just make one quick comment. It, the board and the community is very fortunate to have Adam Swicky on the policy committee because he reads every policy <laughs> and it makes not only grammatical corrections but really important corrections or highlights information. So I would just like like to personally thank Adam for his work on this because I think our policies are better because of him. Agreed. Okay. Call please. Okay, Mr. Swicky. Yes. Ms. Tracy. Yes. Ms. Wolf. Yes. Mr. DiDonato. Yes. Ms. Long. Yes. Mr. Markulak. Yes. Ms. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Murray. Yes. Motion carries. And if I can say one thing before we leave policy, I will commend Dr. Smith. We made we made quite a bit of progress. Uh, during this last period on uh, policy related to equity. Uh, regulation is now going to be starting in work, but that is moving forward. Okay, so next is um, the review of the board calendars. I'd like to make a motion to uh, move the calendars. Second. for March. I think it looks good. Just to one point out one thing. Uh, we had discussed this the last time with policy. Uh, we moved that to Friday the 13th. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so a good luck day. We're going to do one community, community relations, on Lisa. Yeah. yeah, it's on there. Yep. Anything else to add to the calendar? What day is the... Um, um, I would like to get a kind of informal poll of the board. We talked <coughs> earlier in the winter about going to the high school to kind of see what's going on over there. Mm -hmm. Would would you want to do that in April? That's fine with me. Mm -hmm. the the, would, Tom, what do you think? I mean, would you like to do it at the the retreat or do it? No, I'd like to do it at the, the public meeting because um, I think in April we're going to have the, the set SES being group come anyway. Okay. Um, oh, nice. The presentation, so we can do it at the high school. Yeah. So what um, we'll try to do is, is uh, schedule a tour. I just figured because we have all the committees that night, then, mm -hmm. yeah. then you'd have to, to have the tour either real early 
you know, for people if we did it as a retreat. And I don't know. I'm just that's why I was. Discretion. Any preference? Should we do it on the ninth so we don't interfere with our meetings? Uh, I think it would be actually a little nicer to do it at the regular meeting and just maybe adjust your personnel time a little bit and just do it at seven instead right before. Because uh, as Dr. Smith just mentioned, if the Thespians are going to be there, it, it might be nicer to be doing it in their in their mm -hmm. home. Term. I'm just my guess is what time would you want the tour? Seven. Seven. Th okay, it's seven. Boots and Bling is the 13th? Yeah. Yeah, the 13th. It's on there. Is it? Yeah. H-B-E-F. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> is that that is? I'm like, oh, okay. I was like, yeah, are we having a negotiation? <laughs> uh, just a comment about the calendars and the appointments. I, thank you so much for having them in here without me having to re-enter them. But can we add, like, a reminder? Like a oh, yeah. <laughs> You want to have it yeah. like an hour a day? You want, you want so I do a week time? before, and I do a day that. before, and okay. I do an hour or two hours uh, where I am with my coworker. I love that he's asking for that. Okay. <laughs> you got that? You can just click it on there. On How many times do it? Because I'm usually the maintenance one. As well. <laughs> I know. I am. Yeah, but can you do multiple? Yeah. Yeah. We're teaching you guys all sorts of things about <laughs> calendars. I, I don't want know. Pete's reminders. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, because it's either all I or have, none. I can't yeah. believe I'm late. Oh, it's just a reminder. Okay, that's for next week. All right. Well, just don't subscribe just to Pete's calendar. Your own little reminder. Yeah, no, it's, it's crazy. Board this board is craziness. Board. All right. <laughs> all right, so we'll we'll play around with some reminders. All right. You want a, a couple hours before, a day before? Tie strings around your fingers. Dave. I'm tied it around my neck. What do you think, day before? I think it's day before. Yeah. All right, day before, Mr. Pellegrino. It's a wonderful moment. Tied the strings. Okay. You know what will happen to Uncle Billy. <laughs> I need at least 24 hours to, to make an excuse. <coughs> I can't come. Sick. A voice vote to um, accept the calendars. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstained. Motion carries. Okay, items of new business. E learning. So move. Motion. First, all in favor. All in favor. Oh, you need to second. We're all in favor. We love it. We're all in favor. I think it's a great idea. I know other schools who have done it, and I, you know, on a smaller scale, and it's worked out great. You need to do a voice for them. For what? The e learning. Oh. It's transitioning those days. Bob's already school. into tomorrow. So on the table is closing school and transitioning those to e-learning. I mean, you don't really need a vote on these. Uh, what, what I vote. Vote. Aren't you okay. obligated to, like, I mean, the whole e-learning thing. I know you mentioned, who was it, Princeton? That was doing an e-learning program for snow days to replace Pascal. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, so isn't it, isn't, doesn't it say, like, you either have to have a fully functioning school as another option or a fully functioning home that can connect to the e-learning e -learning system? Yes, to count them towards the one, the, the, the mandated school days. These are in addition to that. These are the contractor days. Can I ask one quick question? Like there was some discussion mm -hmm. about other states around here where people from other state DOEs are like making accommodations and stuff. Was there any discussion here? Nope. No. Of course not. <laughs> Even when Hurricane Sandy, that was a big push and the nope. commissioner refused to pull. Even the schools that, that were tremendously impacted had to make up the days. Yeah, so. Tough. We take our Tough days state. seriously in New Jersey. Tough state. Okay. Um, a, voice vote. a voice vote, please. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstained. Motion carries. Members of the public are invited to address the board on any matter for a maximum of three minutes during this portion of the meeting. You are asked to state your name, address, and municipality. In response to your comments, the Board of Education may respond or directly or direct the superintendent to do so. The board may also adopt, opt to take a matter up at a future meeting so the matter is researched by the district administration. Public comment is now open. You can share it. You have to walk up to the oh. Our teacher voice has 
everybody can always hear me. <laughs> 20 years ago, I was sitting in this room doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I now live in Skillman. My name is Judy Gordon and then, and Judy Dexter now. I live in Skillman. And I must say, I couldn't have picked a more impressive time to come to listen to the school board. And I'm almost going to cry, maybe, because it's really a big deal. 20 years ago, it was the school board members who were being threatened with guns. Um, it was us before, before Columbine. I came in here late for a meeting and heard three girls talk down to, it in the, to a guy pushing a broom in the hallway. And I called to three board members together, and we wrote what then came out to be a mission. I don't know if it's still there. But uh, talked about how the people here will learn to respect each other. And I thought it was really amazing when Columbine, they said, this came out later, and they said respect was at the heart of what was going on. Well, why am I here? I'm just here because all I wanted was to talk to your IT person um, about something that happened. And it's a very min minuscule thing, uh, but I would like to find out more. I can speculate on why. I, I uh, worked for an electronics firm for a long time, and I was a teacher for a long time, and an administrator and a principal and all that stuff, um, and two terms here. Um, but I just, I just got so blown away by being with you. I don't know why I'm talking about this. Anyway, I would like to talk about, can I tell them what it was? Yeah, you can tell. This is a, a, a stupid part of our today's society. I, um, I screen my calls with the little thing on the phone, you read who's calling. And I've recently started to get some phone calls from 737 area code. I, I keep my 737 prefix because I like it. I've had the same phone number for 30 years. And I don't answer any of them because I don't know anybody here anymore. And then last week I got a call that said HVRSD on the screen. And I picked it up. And I listened for a minute, and I heard a guy start talking to me about solar energy. They have been driving me crazy for a long mine time. Was, mine was ducks. Oh, really? Oh, well. And I, and I listened for a moment, and then I said, you liar. And he said, you f <gasps> Oh, my goodness. Oh, my. Oh. I have never heard anything like that on the phone said to me by any telemarketer or anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I was stunned. So I, I can speculate about how these things happened, but I, I'm not on social media. I haven't been hacked. Um, I know kind of how these guys work, but I'd like to just talk with the IT person. Is there any leak or anything that you've observed or anything anybody else has had the problem? or? anything that uh, can be done about it uh, because it's it's really disgusting <laughs> yeah live person it wasn't an automated call it was a live person yeah because yours was a robo call yeah yeah so we are I'm sorry that occurred obviously it didn't well it wasn't your fault <laughs> no. but uh, yeah so it's, it's spoofing Is that what yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it's caller ID spoofing it's called yeah it's very yeah. They, they, uh, unfortunately, they, same people call with 18, 25, every, you know, different phone numbers every day. Yeah. Three times a day, they might be the same person. Oh it, it's it, it's very common. Yeah, I know. Um, it, it's a problem with the telecommunications systems. Telecom is not, my business. Not here. Yeah. Um, more so at the at the switching level. Right. But, um, and I know AT and T and Verizon and those folks are working on it, um, but I just Google it and I don't see any you know any quick alternatives. Yeah, when I was working here, I was with Verizon. Was, it wasn't Verizon. I was with AT&T Microelectronics. Okay. And I was doing the stuff about transmission and all that. I mean, that, yeah. that was my deal. So I always think that there might be just there's some way to. There's, I, I can tell you right now, unless it's passed federally, you won't see a change. Yeah. and the FCC. It'll have to be from the federal level, but, you know, now everything's voice over IP. So, right. you know, these services, you can buy them in any country other yeah. than the United States and, yeah. and just pick a, pick a random number. So I can understand, free. though. The thing that bothered me was I can understand how they can get people's names or make up names and they can randomly access numbers. But I don't understand how, like, uh, something like HBRSD comes up. It's a tru All they have to do is very simple. Just look up trusted, like, public, public sector district stuff is all, like, trusted stuff. 
yeah. it's trusted in the community. So I mean, that's if I was looking to get in touch with people yeah. in your community, I would go for a trusted yeah. community. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, we have our numbers listed. You know, seven three seven, boom, boom, boom. And it has so to be something <clears> that is not defined. Like you can't just put Amazon on and say you're Amazon calling because they. You know. We can. <laughs> you could do whatever. They, but they don't usually because. It's, you know. But your caller ID picks up this as just the number. They just do a reverse lookup with the number yeah. to that, and it's <coughs> it's very simple. Like, you could do it on a cell phone. I could spoof. You know, it's. I mean, these things are oh. unless we federally mandate this stuff, it's it's not possible. And but if you want, before you go, you could give me your phone number, because I, I will give it to our IT yeah. and, and so yeah. they can they can do something. <laughs> Thank you so much for. Thanks a lot. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, all in favor of ending our meeting? You have an executive session. Oh, we do. Yeah, well, well, we have to go into executive session. So we're ending the open part of our meeting. All those in favor Aye. going into executive session? Aye. Opposed abstain? Aye. Motion carries.